you might be thinking sharing my faith is quite a daunting prospect. It's not easy to do. It really, at times, can be quite a challenge. Um, but I'll reassure you one or two thoughts. You do find sharing things easy, most of you. In fact, probably all of you. You do find it easy. Anyone that's taken part in the latest word game craze, Wordle, there's an image on the screen, you will understand how easy and important and necessary it is to share your results. If you don't know the game, I've had a little play with it. The game is you've got to guess a daily word. You get one a day. A random word is generated. Five letters. Two, uh, I think this was Tuesdays. The win this isn't today's, no spoilers. Tuesdays was aroma. Now, I've done this as a little kind of introdu introduction to the message. You wouldn't necessarily normally do this. You guess one word, and if any letters from the, the designated word are in, um, so for example, I put share as my guess number one, A and R are in the word. I didn't know what the word was. It goes yellow, and if it's in the right place, it's green. So you whittle it down, hopefully under, in less than six guesses. The point is, at the end of that, a lot of people in the world have pressed share to tell people how many times or how many guesses it took them to get the word. And it's, I've done it. I did it last night. I'm not here to kind of throw um, uh, you know, a spanner at anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm just as guilty. It's so easy to share. On Valentine's Day, it's so easy to share a picture of the one that you love. Any parents out there, how easy. You don't need to ask your children's permission. You just put photos out there. It's not hard to share, people. <laughs> it's very easy to share. In fact, some people overshare, <laughs> whether that be on social media, whether that just be kind of in general conversation. Some of us find it easy to share to the point where maybe we share a little bit too much information. That's me as bad as, as bad as, as you. But sharing the gospel is hard. Now, from my personal point of view, during these last two years of lockdown, I find it hard because life has changed. Mass wearing, kind of, the, our lifestyles have changed. So the art of the conversation, meeting somebody in the shops, on the bus, random conversations with neighbors have changed, I would say. I think it's sometimes difficult to actually have those conversations with people, um, whereas previously it was maybe it was hard for you, but I think they happened a little bit easier because nowadays I find that if I've got to go to the shops, it's right. Mask on, or at least it was. Mask on, in, out, get out there as quick as possible. Don't want to see anyone. Don't want to speak to anyone. I don't know if it's just me, but life, I find my issue with sharing my faith is that I am constantly always in a rush. I'm always in a rush. It's always, I've got to get to the next place. And if there was an opportunity to speak to somebody about my faith, then I would miss it because I either don't notice there's a person over there that could do with Jesus in their life, which is a large portion of a percentage of the population because not everybody knows Jesus. I can miss them. I can rush on and think about my next engagement or my next appointment. I sort of miss the days where I was at university and it was so easy it was so easy to have casual conversations at 2 a.m. in the morning with people about what I believed. It was, I just, I kind of miss those days. I work for a church. All of my colleagues are Christian. I miss the days when I worked in education and I'd be in a classroom and one of the members of staff would say, I've got an issue, would you pray for me? I miss those days. I miss the days where um, I'd have opportunities outside of my work, maybe on a social after hours, you know, what it might be a kind of end of term social, where you talk to people about your faith. I miss those days. That's why for me, I'm in the same boat as many of you. Sharing my faith is hard, particularly given the last two years. I want to try and help you with a passage in the Bible, which isn't necessarily the go-to Bible passage for sharing your faith. But I kind of pull, I want to pull out a few truths and a few thoughts from Luke 17, verse 11 to 19. And it says this. So this is the title, if you're wondering. Why should I share my faith? Why should I? Let Luke and Jesus help us out in Luke 17. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria, as he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
Many of you have been on the World Health Organization website during COVID just to check out you know, the latest trends in COVID-19. I went on for leprosy, typed in leprosy. It's, it's still a thing. <laughs> in fact, leprosy is in 139 countries. I didn't realize that. It's, it's known as Hansen's disease. Um, I believe in... in um, I just noticed my sister and daughter are communicating between the seats. It's distracting. <laughs> but anyway, Hansen's disease. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a moment. I just transported myself out of this message. Back in the zone. Back in the zone. Leprosy. <laughs> Apparently 128,000 reported cases in 2020. And as of COVID, you know, those case numbers will, will be lower than they would be expected. It's, a, it's an infectious disease that affects the skin, um, eyes, um, peripheral nervous system. It's, it's a condition that um, is transported via droplets. We know all about that, don't we? Droplets from the nose and the mouth. And it's not as contagious as historically people thought. It's nowhere near as contagious as cold or, or COVID or anything like that. It, it, it requires close and regular contact. So there's the condition that we're dealing with. Ten people Jesus meets have this condition. Let's read on in verse 14. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests, which was what they would have to do. If anyone was, was healed of a skin disease in those times, they would have to go to the priest. A little bit like you, you'd submit your test results for COVID to a higher authority. We, we would let people know if you were cured. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this Samaritan, this for foreigner? As Jesus said to the, and Jesus said to the man, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. What an amazing transformation. Samaritans and, and, and Jews hated each other. So it's, it is like, literally like a foreigner. It's like, wow, my own people, those other nine, they're my people. They're, you know, they're, they're my crew. And they didn't come back and say thank you. But this foreigner, this person that apparently hates me and, sh and hates all, my, all that I represent, came back, said thank you. Thank you. So the question is, and it's in the scripture, it, it says they were all healed. So why didn't the other nine feel in any way kind of inclined to come back and say thank you for what? The, and in a moment, I'm going to talk about the, um, the transformation that took pay, place in these people. Just from reading that passage, I've got three things. So the question for today's message is, why should I share my faith? I'm just going to begin just really quickly, a freebie before we get into, mes into the message. Why don't I share my faith? Three things. Why, why don't I share my faith? Well, the first one, I believe, is familiar, familiarity. They all begin with an F. Familiarity. Because the foreigner wasn't familiar with Jesus and his practices. Whereas the other, the other nine, they perhaps took Jesus for granted. Maybe they'd been in church, sat on the back row for a number of years. They'd been in and amongst Christians for so long and become desensitized to just how good the gospel is is maybe they were like a lot of people in church and they just become familiar and taken Jesus for granted like I do quite regularly and it took somebody that wasn't so familiar with Jesus to come back and say thank you maybe the second reason we don't share our faith so the first one is familiarity we just get complacent I will add a disclaimer to this message it might hurt a little bit today <laughs> And it hurts me writing it and saying it. But the second thing that might stop us from sharing the gospel is feelings. A little bit like if your loved one does something for you, rather than saying thank you and saying I really appreciate, appreciate what you've done, I just feel thankful. Inside, I feel thankful. Feelings aren't enough. They need reaction and response and words. If I don't tell Steph thank you, how does she know that I'm thankful? In fact, if I stop and I don't say thankful, she thinks I'm potentially rejecting her and I'm not thankful, even if I feel thankful. So if we have a, or think we have, 
a heart for the gospel and for sharing. And we feel it inside, but don't say or do anything about us, about it. Then those feelings are kind of redundant. So feelings, because we feel like we're kind of a good Christian and we feel like we're, we're doing the right thing, but we can forget to go and do something about it. So feelings can stop us. And the third one, which is probably the one that affects most of us, which is fear. Fear of what other people think. Fear of what other people might say. Fear can stop us. But we have to think about how good the gospel is. We have to remind ourselves daily just how good and how much Jesus has done. Why should I share my faith? For one reason, just as again as a freebie, it's just simply to show gratitude. Jesus, you've done so much for me. I need to do something and come back and declare publicly to in front of you, in front of others, that Jesus has done amazing things in my life. But look at those poor lepers. Because in biblical times, first century lepers had no treatment. Nowadays, if you, if you intervene early with leprosy with you know, certain drugs, you can prevent long-term damage to limbs, um, to blindness, eyes, and you, you can prevent with drugs. They didn't have those. So if you had leprosy in those days, you had no hope. You had no chance. You had no chance here on earth. And also, because what would happen is the law would say, well, that person is unclean, so they must go out of town. They must go and live in a, in a colony or community on their own and be completely separated. They must always remain within six feet of anyone, including their loved ones. It's, it, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> but they had no hope of a cure. They couldn't get jobs. They couldn't hug their loved ones ever. No hope ever, 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 ever. They couldn't go to the temple, which is how people receive forgiveness. So there was no hope for them on earth. There was no hope for them in eternity. They were lost souls. So the gospel is good news because of what Jesus does next in their life. He heals them and removes all of that and gives them hope, allows them to get a job, allows them to have relationships, allows them to feel loved and less rejection. The gospel is too good not to share. Let me just prove it because you might be thinking he's making all this up. I know about leprosy. This doesn't sound right. Let me just show you what it says in the Old Testament in Leviticus 13. Because this just paints a picture of just how sorrowful their situation was. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes. So not only are they ill, they have to have bad clothes. <laughs> and bad hair days. They have to leave their hair unkept, cover the lower part of their face, put a mask on, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Now, forgive me for kind of making a joke, because it isn't a joke. But it, it, it sounds familiar to kind of, in some ways, what we've been through. But their situation was so degrading. So difficult. And what Jesus does for them is so good. So four things. I was toying whether I just do three. I'll do the four I haven't got a clock up, so I can speak for as long as I like. <laughs> um, four reasons the gospel is too good not to share. Why should I share my faith? Well, it's too good not to share. It's too good to keep to yourself. So the first one is, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. Part of the kind of um, condition of leprosy was that it would affect the eyes, and if untreated, could lead to, to blindness. And um, you might not be blind. Certainly, you probably don't have leprosy, but... We can all have blind spots in our life. Before me and Steph were even going out, um, let alone engaged and married, somebody had to come to me and say, Ben, you do realize how you are around Steph is leading her down such a path where she is falling for you. Do you realize, and I didn't realize I was so flirtatious, do you realize... <laughs> Because this was, this was before I realized I liked her. This was before I even contemplated the thought of asking her out. Somebody had to point out a blind spot in my life. You might have similar, similar things. There might be people in your life, from, from a negative point of view, that might control you or manipulate you, and you don't know that until somebody says something about it. I didn't know about the sin in my life until somebody said, do you know that you're a sinner? And as a 13, 14-year-old, I was like, oh, really? I did not know that. I didn't know that I was lost until somebody said, I can be found. 
Somebody needs to point out. So no longer am I blind. So many people in the world don't know the secrets that you know. So many people in the world, like I used to be, so like you used to be, are blind. But like those 10 people, those 10 lepers, they now see. So why should I share my faith? It's because I see and others don't. So I need to help them. I see. So I was blind, but now I see. You're no longer in the dark. It's not a guessing game like, oh, I wonder what the meaning of life is. Let's work it out, philosophers. Let's, you know for a fact. You, you know. You're not blind anymore. You know. That's why you should share the faith, because so many others are blind to it. Secondly, I was rejected, but now I'm accepted. Lepers were despised, rejected, kicked to the curb, forced out of camp, forced out of town. Live on your own, no one in your life. Um, your situation may not be that extreme, but you've probably experienced rejection. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough not to have been through major bullying or racism or sexism or all, all the forms of prejudice or discrimination. I'm fortunate, I'm privileged not to have done that. But I felt rejected at times. You, you, you've probably felt rejected and left out. I've, I've shared this story from this platform before, but when I was eight years old, it's good that my sister's here. <laughs> when I was eight, I haven't always lived in Stoke-on-Trent. And places like Alton Towers and Waterworld, for those that don't live in Stoke, are like these magical mystery lands. <laughs> Just these magical worlds. And we had the opportunity as kids, me, my two sisters, and a, a friend on the street, to go to Waterworld. Wow, it's like Disneyland. Wow. So I was getting all excited to go to Waterworld. And half an hour before we were about to go, my two sisters said, actually, Ben, there's not enough room in the car for you. Me... My sister, two parents in the front, you can't come. To this day, <laughs> I've still never been to Waterworld. <laughs> Left out. I've not been to Waterworld. I mean, I've been with Abigail got like, to like the subway, which is in the building, but not in the water park. I can't wait for the day when she's old enough to go to the water park. It'd be full redemption for me. <laughs> and I'll... I would definitely share a photo to my sisters and say, look where I am. Because <laughs> sharing is easy, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you want, you, want, you want to get one up on someone. <laughs> but how good is the gospel that those people that were rejected now have an opportunity to go back into normal life, get a job, feel loved, touch their family and their loved ones and be in relationship with others. They're no longer rejected, but they're accepted. That relationship between them and God, because of sin, because of the uncleanliness, because of not just the, um, the sickness of leprosy, but what sin does to each and every one of us, what life does, we're born into this world and it messes us, us up. Sin is a problem that we can't deal with ourselves and it separates us from God. But that's why Jesus came on the cross to rejoin us and reconcile us back to God. So no longer are you rejected and left on the outside. You're brought in and adopted into the family of God, a son and a daughter, and you're given all those benefits and all those blessings. Those lepers who were rejected now receive the full blessing that you and I get. Wow. Isn't that good? Why should I share the, my faith? It's because it's too good not to share. I was blind, but now I see. I was rejected, but now I'm accepted. I, number three, I was ashamed, but now I'm free. Imagine having, it's a bit gruesome and a bit graphic, but it's real. And I think it's important because 139 countries still have people with leprosy. It's a condition that affects the skin and makes, and people wouldn't even look at people with leprosy. They certainly wouldn't speak to them. It wasn't an attractive Imagine the shame, They're hair unkept, bad clothes, torn. It was just a sorrowful and shameful way of living. Imagine the shame that was taken away because of what Jesus did for them. They had no way of coming to God for forgiveness because they couldn't go anywhere near the temple. They had no way of asking for sacrifice because they couldn't go in. It was just a, sorrow, a sorry situation that they found themselves in. And kind of that's a little bit like how we are. 
You haven't got leprosy, but as I mentioned before, we've all got the impact of what sin do, does to us. We might live kind of moral and pretty law-abiding lives, but we still mess up. We still have sin inside. We still, from an early age, from when we were born into this earth, we were and are and have been sinners. But what Jesus does is he makes us free from the shame. And he, as I said, he adopts us, but he makes, he exchanges our guilt for Jesus' innocence. So on the cross, Jesus took on our guilt and gave us his innocence. He took on our sin and gave us his righteousness. So you're innocent and you're made righteous. How good is the good news? Why would you keep it to yourself? I was once ashamed, but now I am free. Your sins are forgiven. But there's an important side note. You've got to receive and accept that forgiveness. You can't just say, oh, I'm forgiven. I receive it, that free gift. Thank you for your forgiveness, God. And then finally, I was dead, but now I'm alive. The gospel is too good not to share. That leprosy affected the people's peripheral nervous system, so not the central, but the kind of, and it, it could reduce their ability to feel, and, and they become numb. And just their existence, they were neither alive, because they were not truly living, but they were not clinically dead. They were neither alive nor dead. They, were, they lived this sort of zombified state, a little bit like the state that I was in before I found God, just zombified, not really living, but not knowing true life, but not being dead. You're now alive. There are people in this world that are living that zombified existence, and we need to tell them that you can have life and all its fullness. I used to be dead in my sin, but now I have new life. I'm born again. You can receive a brand new star, a new creation. The old you has gone. The new has come. So I was blind, but now I see. I was rejected, but now I'm accepted. I was ashamed, but now I'm free. I was dead, but now I'm alive. How good is the gospel? Why would you not want to share this good news? And I'm, sa- I'm not saying it's not hard because I find it hard, but I need to remind myself, other people need to hear this good news because it is so good. So the question I've got for you, and in a moment, we're going to worship, and I want to give an opportunity today to respond. I don't know everybody's situation. I don't know everybody in the room But I'd love it if today somebody would, maybe for the first time today, receive and accept Jesus um, into their life. Are we up for that? (laughs) I'm going to try and help you in the next couple of minutes before we sing. But the question is, will you, like that one, come back to Jesus? Isn't it interesting? There are about 2.2 billion Christians in the world, apparently. And maybe the the numbers aren't exact. This is not an exact science. But 10% of the people came back to Jesus and publicly declared how good God is, and and lay at his feet and praised him. Maybe that's an expression of what the church is like. 90% of the church stay where they are. They don't come back. Let's make a decision to be one of those 10% of that 2.2 billion apparent Christians in the world who go back, who come back to Jesus and declare his name publicly to others. Because, and this is where we're zeroing in, Jesus is coming back to you. Matthew 25 says this, but when, this is verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, when he comes back, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from his goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Good news. But there is a bit of bad news as well. Verse 41, the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. And it's not always easy talking about hell. Because many people in this world experience hell on earth. You go to, just pick a few out, Afghanistan, or you go to war-torn 
countries or you go to child abuse victims or any number of different abuse scenarios or sicknesses or diseases or, or issues in life. People do experience hell on earth. But there's a hell that's reserved for the devil and his demons. I don't want to go there. And I don't want anyone else to go there. And let me just help you because it's shocking in some ways to think that place exists. But I, I do need to remind you that <laughs> there's eternal life on the other side. Just one verse before what I just read. But let me just read something from the resurrection narrative. So we all know if you've ever been in church on Easter about res Jesus' resurrection and his crucifixion. But let me just read something to you, which I just read in a different light, having read what I've just read. In Luke 23, verse 33. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. One criminal on his right, one criminal on his left. I just see the comparison immediately. I don't know if you do. Verse 39, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. <laughs> so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he, then he said, Jesus, we know, many of us know this passage and we've committed it to memory because it's so, the gospel is such good news. What on earth did this guy, this criminal, do to deserve this grace from God? Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you'll be with me in paradise. One on his right, one on his left. God, I want to be one on your right. I don't want to be on your left. God, those that I love and those that I know, I want to be on your right, not on your left. I don't want to know people who reject you openly and scoff at you and mock you and abuse you. Because many of us probably do know people like that. We need to pray that they would go to his right hand side and that God would, that they, well they would admit their wrongdoings like you and I have had to do as well. So it's not too late to receive Jesus. It isn't too late. Because you can be on your deathbed and receive Jesus. I don't know what that guy did to deserve that grace from God. But it's, it's so amazing. But it's also not too late to share your faith. If you've never done it before, you can start today. But I will add a final thing. I know the band are up and that's great. We're going to sing. I want to lead us in a prayer as well. But there will come a time where it is too late. We don't know when Jesus will come back and do the left and the right thing. We don't know. Even Jesus doesn't know that. But there will come a time where it is too late. So let's make sure that we do it before then. And there is no better time than today, which is why at the beginning of this message, I sort of got the sense that someone today can make that, I'm going to go on the right-hand side decision today, moving from the left to the right. I'm going to help you. We're going to do it as a congregation, as a group. Even those online can join in with us. And then we're going to sing a song. And then I think I'll jump back up and give an opportunity. I'm going to read on the screen. We're going to read it out loud together. A prayer. A simple prayer. And then when we've sort of finished that prayer, the band will lead us in a song. I'll jump back up after that song and offer an, an opportunity for somebody to let me and maybe one or two people in the room know that you've prayed that prayer earnestly and maybe even for the first time. Many people in this room have prayed this prayer a lot. So don't say silent. Church, I need you to help those that haven't prayed this ever before. We're going to do it together. So should we stand to our feet? It's a simple prayer that effectively that that guy on the right did in that moment. It's I guess you could, you could argue it's the same sort of prayer that the one, that the one leopard probably said, maybe said with Jesus when the other nine kind of stayed away. Let's be these, the people that pray 
this kind of prayer. And we'll, we'll do it together. We're going to try and do this in unison. Then the band will play and I'll get back up and see. And, and, and ask for anybody in the room that's, that's prayed this prayer. So let's do it. It starts like this. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the son of God, that you died for my sins and that you were buried and rose again as written in the Bible. I'm sorry for the things I've done that hurt you. Forgive me for all my sins. Come into my heart. Take charge of my life and make me the way you want me to be. With your ever-present help, I renounce all my sinful practices of the past. Cleanse my heart with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life. I confess you now as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit.